For some of you, good afternoon. For others, wherever you are, my name is Jamima Pierre, and I am and I am the Haiti Americas coordinator. We will turn it over to um, Jean-Viev, who will explain, provide a welcome and explain the interpretation. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And I will explain in English and then I will explain in Espanol. Um, I am Jean-Viev Williams Comrie. I am the executive director of Afro Resistance, an organization that is committed um, to human rights, racial justice, and democracy in the Americas. Language justice is just exactly that. It is a way of communicating what is most powerfully in one's language that is one is most powerful in. This um, webinar will be conducted in four languages. It will be conducted in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Creole. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a globe that is round. If you click on that globe, you will see four languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. The French is actually Creole, right? So if you click on that, click on your language of preference. I will also be putting some instructions here in, in the chat. Um, when the presenter is speaking in Spanish, Portuguese, or Creole, you click that button and you it will pop up. If you click English, you will see the speaker's video, but you will hear the simultaneous interpretation in English. When the presenter speaks in English, if you would like to hear um, another language, then click the button again. Make sure you click off to, um, to listen to um, make sure you click off to listen to um, the interpretation through the through your headset. Otherwise, you're going to be listening to two different um, interpretations at the same time. It is very important to understand that we are humans. This is technology. You might miss something. Interpreters take a minute to adjust the language. So you might see the person speaking and you might not hear anything. It doesn't mean that it's not working. It means that the interpreters are listening to then translate for you. So be patient. Language means patience. Don't freak out and type on the chat. It's not working. I can't hear anything. It means sit still and believe that interpreters are thinking to communicate. It also means that technology takes a second. It means that the channel might be working its thing out. And it also could mean technology might be not functioning and you might need to sit still and wait for it to do its thing. It doesn't mean that it's not working. It also means that it might be a name like jean Vieve, and the interpreter might not need to translate it because you're already listening. So make sure to pay attention to what, the trans to what the speaker is saying so you don't heavily rely on the translator. Make sure you don't overuse the chat because sometimes we tend to write a lot of things on the chat and you're not going to uh, receive the trans, not everybody's gonna be able to receive the translation on the chat. So make sure you use the chat a little bit so you don't put the burden on the translators to translate into all the languages. So enjoy the call. Make sure you keep all the brothers and sisters and siblings that don't understand the languages in mind. Ahora lo voy a hacer en español. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos y bienvenides a esta llamada. Me llamo jean Williams Combri. Soy la directora ejecutiva de Afro Resistencia. Ustedes van a ver al final um, de la pantalla un globo redondo con, el, con interpretación. Si hacen clic en ese globito, van a ver cuatro lenguajes, inglés, español, portugués y creol. El de creol dice francés. Si hacen clic, eso es creol. Entonces, um, tengan paciencia porque 
las y les intérpretes están trabajando muy duro. El lenguaje toma paciencia. Cuando hacen clic, tienen que poner mudo al lenguaje original. El lenguaje original, entonces pueden um, escuchar el lenguaje que seleccionan. Puede ser inglés, español, um, portugués o creol. Si no escuchan nada, no significa que no está funcionando. No significa que tienen que escribir. No escucho nada, no funciona. Significa paciencia, esperen y le intérprete va a comenzar a traducir mom eh, momentáneamente. El lenguaje toma paciencia, así que siéntense y disfruten. Um, el chat no lo utilicen un montón porque significa que los intérpretes también tienen que traducir. Entonces tengan un poco de paciencia con nosotros y disfruten este webinar. Muchas gracias a todas, todos y todas. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jamima. My name is Jamima Pierre, and I am the Haiti America's coordinator for Black Alliance for Peace. And from here on, on out, I will refer to Black Alliance for Peace as BAP. Welcome to African Liberation in the Americas, a webinar on Haiti, Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela. This webinar is organized in anticipation of the events for African Liberation Day on May 25th, but it also represents the opportunity for BAP to begin rolling out the expanded vision for our future work in the so-called American hemisphere. For BAP, Haiti is key to this vision Some may be aware of BAP solidarity actions with Haiti earlier this spring as the Haitian population continued its protests against an illegitimate president installed and backed by the imperialist forces of the US, the Organization of American States and a UN occupation. For BAP, Haiti is the real and symbolic ground in which resistance is being waged, once again, to liberate the territory from foreign control and to serve as a strategic space for supporting the still unfulfilled anti-colonial struggle of the Caribbean and the broader Americas region. As a liberated territory, Haiti became the launching ground for the war of independence from Spain that was waged by the forces organized around Simon Bolivar in 1823. It was in Haiti that Bolivar's forces received training, arms, and refuge for Spanish, from Spanish forces. Along with Haiti, Brazil, the country that has the largest population of Africans outside of Africa, and Colombia with the, with the third largest population of Africans outside the continent, are the natural political spaces for BAP's extended work beyond the borders of the US. Both Brazil and Colombia re represent two of the most sophisticated and developed Black resistance movements in the African world. The structural connections between Haiti, Brazil, and Colombia are being forged in a crucible of police violence and state terror, dispossession, and economic exploitation. But linking with the struggles of, the, of African peoples in Haiti, Colombia, and Brazil would not be complete without connecting those struggles with the ongoing struggles to liberate all of the Americas, including Black folks in North America and the Caribbean, from US and European political and economic control. And for that, the revolutionary process in Venezuela is crucial, especially with this large black population that is a critical element of the Bolivian revolutionary process. In short, the African nations of the Caribbean and the Americas are crucial to African liberation. Drawing on the collective knowledge of black activists and scholars, this webinar uh, from Haiti, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, and the US, this webinar will examine how forms of anti-black repression extend across the geographic, national, linguistic divisions of the hemisphere, only to be resisted by a shared culture and tradition of African revolt and autonomy. We are joined today by a distinguished panel of activists and, panel, uh, uh, and, activists and scholars. Our panelists are Ana Barreto, Jesus Chucho Garcia, Gerald Horn, and Charo Minas Roja. Our first speaker will be Professor Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn holds the John J. and Rebecca Morris Chair in History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. 
Before he was a history professor, Dr. Horn was an attorney with the National Conference of Black Lawyers and involved in anti-apartheid and trade union activism. As well, he was a contributor to a number of socialist and Marxist publications. The author of more than 30 books, Horn's scholarship and activism address white supremacy, imperialism, labor, politics, civil rights, international relations, and war. His scholarly canvas is truly global with titles such as The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy and Capitalism in the second, 17th Century North America and the Caribbean, Confronting Black Jacobins, The US, The Haitian Revolutions and the Origins of the Dominican Republic, Race to Revolution, The US and Cuba During the Slavery and Jim Crow, The Deepest South, The US, Brazil and the African Slave Trade. Not only is Professor Horn the foremost radical historian of his generation, but as many know, his historical research is always deployed in the service of Black liberation. But before I pass it on to our first speaker, you may have noticed that we have ASL interpreters. We will have ASL interpretation throughout the webinar. And for the visually impaired, we have agreed to announce ourselves before we speak and when we hand it off to another person. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box or in the Q&A box so we can answer them later on in the program. And now I will hand it over to Professor Horn. Welcome, Professor Horn. Well, thank you. And thank you to BAP for inviting me. Thank you to Professor Pierre for that gracious introduction. Uh, second, uh, I'm going to try to speak in a cadence that facilitates interpretation and mutual um, multiple translations. So I hope that English speakers will excuse me. And third, my brief remarks will mostly be about slavery. That is to say laying the foundation for how and why black people from Africa wound up in the Americas in the first instance. Now in the late 18th century, uh, two profound processes unfolded in the Americas that was to have consequence for the entire hemisphere. In 1776, you had a revolt led by slave owners, driven by the lust for indigenous land and the felt desire to continue and accelerate the enslavement of Africans, which they had thought might be in jeopardy because of a growing abolitionist movement, not only in the Caribbean, but also reflected in London itself. Another process unfolded beginning in 1791, culminating in 1804 with the Haitian Revolution, which was driven by anti-slavery. Needless to say, the newly born United States of America was quite hostile to revolutionary Haiti. And indeed in 1844, aligned with forces in a sizable portion of the island to engineer a split that led to the creation of the Dominican Republic. Haiti, on the other hand, sponsored abolitionists and anti-slavery movements compelling London to abandon the slave trade by 1807 and slavery itself by 1833. Interestingly, after Texas, where I am now sitting, seceded from Mexico in 1836 on similar grounds of pro-slavery, because Mexico had moved to abolish slavery in the late 1820s under the leadership of a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero. After Texas seceded successfully from Mexico on pro-slavery grounds, Haiti and an international abolitionist movement put so much pressure on independent Texas that it decided to join the United States in 1845, where it still resides. Uh, this was an attempt to continue its slave trading operations because independent Texas during this brief 
existence as an independent nation was a major slave trading force with its flagged slave ships found off the coast of Angola, off the coast of Brazil, and certainly in Cuba. Mexico, uh, it's fair to say, was probably the major victim of US expansionism, not least because Mexico offered a refuge to enslaved Africans fleeing not only from the United States, but from the Caribbean as well. As a result, you saw the United States wage war against Mexico in 1846, which led to the United States seizing a sizable portion of Mexican land including California, which today is the wealthiest and most populous state in the United States of America, and by some measures contains the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. Thereafter, the United States continued to try to seize Mexican territory, often with the help of traitorous Mexican forces. I should also say that Brazil, was a major victim of Washington. U.S. slave traders are largely responsible for the point that Professor Pierre mentioned, that is to say that Brazil has the largest Black population outside of West Africa itself. In the 1840s, U.S. flagged ships could be found yeah, off the coast of Mozambique, off the coast of Angola, seizing and manacling Africans and dragging them across the Atlantic to toil in Brazil. There were powerful forces in Washington as well who wanted to execute in Brazil what they had executed in Mexico. That is to say, they had this scheme that suggested that the Amazon River in some ways was an oceanographic extension of the Mississippi River. And so therefore, the United States should seize the Amazon River Valley and indeed expel a good deal of the population of the United States of America to be enslaved workers in the Amazon River Valley. Uh, fortunately, that plan did not exist, did not, uh, did not uh, succeed. Uh, I should also say that all the while these diabolical schemes were taking place, it was Haiti through its diplomatic missions, particularly in London, uh, that was plotting against the United States, even though the United States did not recognize Haiti diplomatically until the US Civil War in the 1860s, when the United States government was on the verge of being overthrown by energized fanatical slave owners. I should also mention that Central America was also a site where Haiti and the United States clashed. It was in the 1850s that a US pirate by the name of William Walker seized power with a band of cutthroats in Nicaragua with the idea of reviving enslavement of Africans in Nicaragua, which had been banned in 1838. Once again, throughout this entire period, it was Haiti that was standing tall as the first independent Black Republic that was campaigning on our behalf. It's fair to say that the Haitian Revolution was not only a victory, for the millions of enslaved Africans in the Americas, the Haitian Revolution was a victory for all working class people because the existence of slavery drove down the wages and working and living standards of all people who sold their labor for a living. And so therefore the Haitian Revolution needs to be saluted by us all just as independent Haiti today deserves our solidarity. In fact, I think we should stress that there are two nations in particular that deserve the solidarity of us all. 
not only the Haitian Revolution, but the Cuban Revolution uh, executed successfully 155 years after the Haitian Revolution in 1959. Finally, uh, let me make another point with regard to solidarity uh, that could be considered uh, scholarly solidarity. Uh, I propose to the Haitian Studies Association, and there seems to be favorability towards this proposal, uh, that we enlist an international team of researchers to dig into the archives of Caracas and Bogota in particular, but not exclusively, to uncover the documents that document how abolitionist Haiti was the main campaigner against enslavement of Africans before 1888 when the enslavement process uh, came to a kind of halt in Brazil. That is to say, to copy and scan these documents, email them, forward them so that they can be published in books, so that they can be disseminated on the internet, so that we can all gain a deeper understanding of the debt that all working class people owe to Haiti and the debt that all black people, not only in the Americas, but worldwide owe to Haiti. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, back to Professor Pierre, sorry. Thank you so much for this wonderful contribution, um, Dr. Horn. Um, we will return to you when we get to the question and answer uh, uh, section. And so now I will uh, introduce our next panelist. Um, um, it, our next panelist is uh, Ana Paula Pareto, who is a director of program, programs for Afro resistance in New York. She's a scholar, researcher, and activist on global health race and gender justice with special focus on black women and girls and is a fellow of the United Nations Fellowship Program for the People of African Descent. Anna has more than 15 years of experience as a human rights professional working in several countries of the Americas and Africa doing innovative work on global health and reproductive justice. In 2008, um, she developed the project analyzing the intersection between economic empowerment and health outcomes outcomes of women and children in Ethiopia, as well as the first Black Brazilian film festival on the African continent. Ana is also the co-founder of Projeto, Projeto 111, a project that teaches young people in the favelas of Brazil how to use media tools to tell their own stories and disrupt police brutality through story storytelling. Welcome, Ana. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I have a very short presentation, thank you so much. Um, I, I, was, I was to give a short background presentation about Brazil and Brazil political and economic situation right now. So that's, that's what my focus would be. Uh, I also apologize to my uh, Brazilian friends and colleagues who might be here, but I chose to, to speak in English uh, just for, for the sake of uh, this is international space. And as I always said, we Brazilians, we, we already know um, what, what we are facing every day. We just want more people to, to know uh, what, we, what we are facing. Um, so I uh, want to say a little bit about the political and economic situation of Brazil today. Uh, can you pass to the next, please? Yes. So uh, Brazil now face a political and economic crisis. We have a far-wing president uh, that is really basically destroying the country, destroying the, the, the political system of the country, the institutions trying to destroy the social movement uh, and they, they're trying to do that by basically killing us. That Brazil has more than 50 million cases of COVID-19 uh, today, more than 444,000 people died uh, due to COVID in Brazil. Uh, and there is no social policies or not even any, any type of, or 
lockdown politics or, or any federal uh, measure to try to stop the virus. It really looks like that the administration wants uh, the virus to spread and kind of become a, a, a new way to keep uh, promoting the genocide of black people in Brazil. Um, today, uh, due, to, due to COVID especially as well as to, to the genocidal act of the current presidency, uh, more than 50% of Brazilians are facing hunger or food insecurity. And, and of course, that, uh, that's, that's the, we are talking about the black and poor population here. So the black movement in Brazil, it's really trying to focus on um, mutual assistance projects. So food delivery, um, as well as uh, some, some cash initiatives to try to um, kind of do the, the job that the state should be doing. And throughout my presentation, you would also see pictures of children. And these children were killed by, by the Brazilian police. And uh, black people, we face two different types of deaths. That is the physical death, and that is also the epistemological death, including the memory. So it is important to say our stories to say our names and to remember that. So that's why there are the pictures of children and their names. So this is Emily and Rebecca. Emily was four, Rebecca was eight. They were killed while playing in front of their home. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit about uh, the police uh, in Brazil. So um, as was said before, we are, 54% of the Brazilian population, uh, the, the biggest uh, African population outside Africa. Um, only in 2021, so until today, the Brazilian police has killed more than 3,000 people. 80% uh, of the victims are Black. And between 2017 and 2019, the police killed about over 2,000 children. And Agatha, uh, the picture that you can see now, is one of them. Um, the Brazilian, the, the Rio police is the most violent police in Brazil. The Rio police alone killed three times more than the national average of the killings uh, promoted by the Brazilian police. Um, the Brazilian police killed um, 31 more times than the US police. And just for, for another measure of comparison, the Brazilian police kill more than five times more than the Japanese police. Um, uh, another point to say is that 70% of the children killed by the Brazilian police are black children. Um, next slide, please. So today I wanna to mention uh, two cases regarding memory uh, and regarding uh, the history of police and black people in Brazil as well as our resistance. So 15 years ago in Sao Paulo, the city where I'm from, it happens what we call crimes of May. And between 12 and 21st of May, the, the Sao Paulo police killed over 500 people. Uh, in one of the, the worst massacres in Brazilian uh, history. Um, the, the, just to give a context, um, what happened is there were, there were happened a lot of like riots in the prisons in Sao Paulo. And, uh, and the, the police um, response was very violent. So it, it came out of the prisons as well and, um, and police and that squads would be killing every person that was on the street after 10 p.m. So any person, and uh, I, I am from the favelas of Sao Paulo and I remember that day, I remember that day. Uh, and uh, there were cars passing on, on our streets saying, whoever is out after 10 will be killed. So be inside. Um, so this happens for, for almost 12 days. 
um, the the crimes were never they, they were never investigated. So even 15 years after, never no investigation, um, no condemnation of the state. Uh, there was the creation of important movie called Mothers of May, uh, which 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 led by the mothers of the victims. Here, I want to also say the name of Verinha, which one of the mothers, um, her daughter was uh, pregnant at the time with her husband. They were both uh, two of the victims killed, Andrew And Verinha was a very strong uh, fighter for justice. Um, but she, after so many years, she faced very deep depression and uh, and she passed away a couple of years ago. So here again, we also need to think about the victims of brutality, not only about the people that physically kill, but how level violence affect us in very different ways and how many of us um, get sick and die to do depression because we cannot face that level of violence. Uh, this is a picture of João Pedro Matos, 14 years old, uh, killed by the police in Rio last year uh, at his home. Um, next slide. Thank you. So that's the most recent massacre that we faced. This was last week. So uh, a little bit about Jacarezinho is the Carezinho is the blackest favela in Rio. Uh, it, it has about 30, 37,000 residents. And last week on May 6, 200 police officers decide to invade the favela uh, with, the, um, with the excuse to say that they are looking for drug dealers. And uh, there were helicopters, there were pepper bombs, and 28 people were killed at that day in, in a matter of four to five hours. Um, and here we also need to think about residents that could not leave their house uh, to or go, go to the grocery store uh, or even go to work. Um, there was a pregnant woman they have a C-session scheduled for that day. They could not leave. Um, and there were also like elderly people that could not go to their um, health appointments. Uh, and and these this are also the, the level of violence that we also need to think about. 20 people were killed, but a thousand were affected by uh, the helicopters flowing over their, their head for five hours the pepper bombs, uh, they were not able to leave their houses or even journalists were not able to, to enter the favela to even um, trying to stop the violence. So that's one of the things that happened. When they're journalists, the, the police behave less badly. So one of the things that the residents uh, do at first, they call, they call the media. And, and, and of course, that one of the things that the police also do is they do barricade so the media cannot arrive and they change the scene of crime. So then it becomes um, in, in, a, in, in a way to make it difficult to, to get any persecution. Uh, that's Ana Carolina Nevis. Uh, she was eight years old and she was killed while watching TV with her father last year as well. Um, just for, uh, just to close my, my presentation, can you go to the next slide to see if I have something else, please? Yeah, no, okay, thank you. Can you go back? Uh, just, so just to close my presentation, I, I also want to say that when, when uh, a police officer is killed, so in Jacarezinho, when they enter, one police officer was killed. Uh, and, and that's why one of the reasons why so many people were killed. Police were a system of revenge. So if, if, a, if a police officer is killed, 
the violence in that territory or in that neighborhood on that same day will increase more than a thousand percent. That that means that the police officers will come back and shoot any person that that is there. In in, in a week after, is still increase about three hundred percent. And on the second week, will be is to still increase more than a hundred percent. So that's that's just a little bit about the the Brazil context. Um, I I want to honor the children that that, that were killed. Um, as I said, uh, one of the, the 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 violence that we face is that our names are not saying our our stories are not told. And that's why the project uh, 111 was created to, to tell the stories of the victims, to humanize them and to say their names. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we are now joined um, by Charo Minas Rojas, Mina Rojas who is a Colombian human rights defender and black feminist scholar with nearly 30 years of activism with the Black Com Communities Process, PCN, the acronym. Her, her work focuses on defending the collective rights of the Afro-descended people and Afro-descended women into ancestral territories for self-determination and against racism. For PCN, Mina Rojas has served as a national coordinator of advocacy and outreach in the US. She was part of the ethnic commission that worked to ensure the inclusion of the ethnic chapter in the final peace agreement in Colombia, which contains provisions to ensure the protection of Afro-descended Afro collective rights. Mina Rojas was also selected in her capacity as a member of the human rights team of the Black Communities Process in Colombia, a member of the Afro-Colombian Solidarity Network, and a member of the special high level body for ethnic peoples to represent civil society at the United Nations Security Council open debate on women and peace and security. She is a member of BAP's advisory and international solidarity committees. Welcome Charo. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from the uh, Afro ancestral territories of life, joy, hope and freedom in Colombia, and from our principle of reciprocal solidarity and participation of global, social, racial, and gender justice, I express our respect and solidarity with the people of in Haiti, as we recognize its outstanding historical contributions to our Afro-descendant Afro struggles in Colombia. I want to thank you also the interpreters and especially the uh, sign language interpretation. Uh, thank you for helping us to break the exclusion that language can add to injustice. I would like to start by a general overview of Colombia. Colombia is a country of 48 million people. It's nine times smaller than the United States so you ha can have a perspective. It is called the largest democracy in Latin America, yet one with a historical widespread of violence and serious human rights abuses, impunity and corruption. It is also identified and named as the best ally in the United States, uh, best ally for the United States in the region and recipient of the largest economic and military support from the United States. It's over 15 billion um, US taxpayers dollars. It has been under the long standing armed conflict for more than 50 years that's supposed to end in 2016 with the sign of the peace accord, which has been prized as globally, uh, prized globally as an unprecedented uh, because in the paper, it looks to establish participation, gender and ethnic as central components of peace, as well as uh, rural reform. Colombia has a very sophisticated constitution. It was amended in 1991 that recognized itself as a pluri-ethnic nation with indigenous and Afro-descendant recognized as people with collective rights and particularly collective land property 
which could be considered a very revolutionary possibility. One because it uh, could open the possibility of transforming the notions of a one nation from one nation to pluri nation state. And two, because uh, having more than 40% of collective owned lands by indigenous and afro-descendants instead of individual uh, property, this could be a starting point for, connect, uh, for contesting capitalism. Colombia is also the third country with the largest afro-descendant population in the region after Brazil and the United States with a city with the second largest afro-descendant population in the region also, which is Cali. Today, the center of clashes and repression in the context of the national strike. But Colombia is also a country ventured into a quest for the establishment of neoliberalism as a source of economic uh, development. Colombia has aspired not only to be the best military allied of the United States, but also to be an economic power in Latin America. It is why these two milestones of the 1991 constitution and the 2016 peace accord uh, were looking to establish those conditions for neoliberal economic hegemony, uh, hegemony and power. Today, Colombia is uh, big news because of the national strike that have called people on the streets for 25 days, blocking the main access to and circulation to the country's economy. However, na national strikes in Colombia have been escalating to talk just the recent, uh, since 2015, with a very um, uh, strong national strike in that year. And then in 2017, the uh, Paro Civico in Buenaventura also uh, that faced severe repression under the Peace Nobel Prize President Santos. In 2019, we had another national strike against tax reforms. Um, that ended with over 900 detentions and 300 people injured. So now what are the characteristics of these strikes? Mostly impoverishment, disenfranchised, excluded, racialized, gendered, brutalized people at the front lines receiving extreme police repression to the point of gun shooting and killings and racially and socially profiled. profiling. This is a country with 30% of unemployment, 6.5 million new people impoverished this year, over 4 million people that don't have what to eat, 8 million internal displaced people um, from which 1.5 million are after sentence, half of them women, <clears throat> living now in these long belts of empowerment, uh, impoverishment in cities like Cali. Territories encroached, by reorganized armed groups between narco traffic, guerrilla, and paramilitaries, territories, cities, neighborhoods, and bodies systematically brutalized and militarized. We PCN uh, documented 471 cases just last year against Black Afro descendant people, 90 young people killed between the 14 and 30 years old people killed, and the increase of violence against women and little girls you know, rape, torture, mutilations of girls six, eight years old, like um, an you show in Brazil. Collective rights, especially territories rights have been violated. Racialization, as I say, and gender polarization, stigmatization, attacks on sectors of people that are characterized by gender and race, racialization. We have a president and a party that campaign uh, in 2008-18, using the so-called gender ideology as main argument against the peace accord as it threatens the family and gender core values of this patriarchal sexy, sexy social system. We talk about brutal repression and there is a little image I hope that can be shown you so you can see the numbers of the national strike today. You know, we have 80 control, control points. People have set control points. And um, uh, the, the, the repression now uh, brings over 2,000 cases of attacks from police to people. Over 1,600 people detained, 87 cases of sexual abuse, violence, and rape. 
uh, that took actually caused the life of a 70 year old girl. 52 people killed, 70%, 77% of that people in Cali and the black belts of Cali. All these are anti-capitalist responses from the victims of capitalism because under the guise of neoliberal capitalist economy growth and development, we, the people, have been declared enemy and the, therefore military target of also a racist, patriarchal, and very misogynist authoritarian ultra-right regime right now. Now we have also to focus attention on the highly racialized nature of this situation. Cali, for instance, is the epicenter of the repression on this strike, not only because it's the, uh, strategically located in the country, um, but Cali is also the second largest, as I say, city with black and people. It is not only a social and economic injustices, it's also gender and racial based injustices, what is mobilizing this very diverse strong force of contesting, disputing, confronting, demanding power. At the end, for us as a pro descendants, uh, this is a call for decolonization. To close my intervention, I would like to say that, of course, this is not only Colombia. We just heard Haiti, we just heard Brazil. Uh, we have to talk also about Honduras and Black people suffering there. It is the confrontation of development, racialization, and gendering power relations that have been the basis for the construction, at least in this country, but we can see it in, in others, and the construction of a country and nation like Colombia using violent strategies where militarization and terror are the main tools. And these are bases and strategies of capitalism. What well, are common points here are capitalism, racism, and gender in, in, or, or in other words, racial and gender discrimination, imperialism, militarism, and the critical question about the crisis of modernity and coloniality that was uh, marking um, last year with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and a question of what it means today to bring uh, back power to restore power to the people to restore an order, an order that dignify life in all forms, humanize over individualize, put fundamental rights of life beings, uh, the right of good living over the profit of exploitation, plunder, and greed of few human individuals. It is a struggle between collective rights and liberal individualistic rights. Ayamu Araka will call this a people-centered human rights struggle. I will improve this theory proposing <laughs> that this is people's and nature-centered rights struggle. For me and for a decolonized, anti-racist, Afro-centered woman's perspective, territories, rivers, mountains, nature are life beings with much rights as humans have. That is why we have managed to get the rights of rivers ruled by law now in our ancestral territories. I will leave it here for uh, questions and conversation. Thank you very much. And I turn it over to Jemani. Thank you so much, Charo, for this wonderful presentation, um, um, which was excellent. And um, we are moving on to our final panelists before we turn it over to questions and answers. And I would like to say that even though um, um, the, the questions and um, because we are simultaneously broadcasting on Facebook Live, we will go through the questions and, uh, and answers that are being posed uh, on Zoom as well for the, all the attendees to um, be engaged in the conversation. Um, the, our, our final panelist and presenter is Jesus Chucho Garcia, who is an Afro-descendant writer, diplomat, and activist for the rights of people of African descent. He's a founder of the Miguel Acosta Senye Center for African American Studies. He's also a former ambassador from Venezuela to various African countries, a longtime leader of the Afro-Venezuelan movement, and an internationally recognized revolutionary Pan-Africanist. Welcome, Chucho.
Uh, do you listen to me and see me? Hello? Yes, we can see you. Yes, and hear you. Okay, and listen. Okay. Okay, voy a hablar en español, no? Voy a hablar en español. Uh, en primer lugar, quiero agradecer la invitación de Black Alianza por la Paz para este tema que es um, muy ético. <coughs> es un tema ético. Haití para nosotros es ético, para nosotros los venezolanos y para muchos en América Latina. Y gracias a esta invitación. <coughs> en primer lugar, América Latina le debe mucha, mucho, mucho a Haití. Todos sabemos que la revolución haitiana fue la primera diáspora africana triunfante fuera de África. Y estamos hablando de este tema porque la convocatoria es por el Día de África. Y hablar de África en América Latina es hablar de Haití. Y hablar de Haití es hablar también de esa primera rebelión que se inició desde que fueron secuestrados nuestros ancestros africanos, bien sea en Congo, bien sea en lo que es Oye Benin o lo que es Mali, y que esos códigos morales, éticos ¿no? de la rebelión se congregaron en Haití. Y por eso es que Haití, con esa congregación de todos esos códigos éticos, morales, espirituales, produce esa primera rebelión. Esa primera rebelión desde Macandal, Cecil Fatima en Boacaimán, Susan Lobartur y de Salín, posteriormente con Petión, van a iluminar a nuestro continente. Era una luz en medio de la oscuridad. Por eso, Petión ayuda a Haití y se va a crear el primer ejército de hombres y mujeres de la diáspora africana que van a contribuir a liberar seis países, Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia, Perú, Ecuador y Panamá. Y también estaba la perspectiva de México y también estaba la perspectiva de Cuba por el oriente de Cuba. Fue el primer ejército de hombres y mujeres afrodescendientes que ayudaron a tener una visión diferente a la revolución haitiana y diferente a la independencia de Estados Unidos. Eso, por supuesto, tenía un costo. El haberse atrevido a buscar esa libertad y más de los africanos y sus descendientes tenía un costo y había que comenzar a desmontarlo. Allí comenzó el bloqueo. Es el primer bloqueo contra una revolución triunfante que se en América Latina. Comienza el bloqueo contra Haití. Comienza también el bloqueo del punto de vista espiritual contra el vudú, que se hizo a través del concordato romano. Toda esa situación y todas esas consecuencias que sufrió el pueblo de Haití, hoy la estamos sintiendo en los resultados concretos que está viviendo el pueblo haitiano. Ese intento incluso de bloqueo, con el tiempo lo intentaron contra Cuba y no pudieron, no pudieron contra el bloqueo a Cuba. Y lo están intentando contra nosotros en Venezuela y tampoco han podido si con Haití lo, lo experimentaron en un momento determinado, cuando Haití estaba muy sola, pero contra Cuba y Venezuela aún no han logrado y creo que tampoco lo van a lograr. Hoy podemos decir de que la, 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 la deuda ética, la deuda moral que ha tenido Venezuela con Haití se va a concretar fuertemente cuando llega el presidente Chávez al poder. Casi inmediatamente después que Chávez llega al poder, él pide visitar Haití en el 2007, en el año 2007. 
En el año 2007, Hugo Chávez y su expresidente del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores, Nicolás Maduro, que hoy es el presidente de Venezuela, rompen las barreras de seguridad y caminan casi una hora corriendo con el pueblo haitiano. Eso ustedes lo pueden buscar en video de cómo Chávez se integró a ese pueblo haitiano. Chávez, Chávez entendió la deuda moral, ética, sentimental, afectiva que se tenía. De 2007-2008, Chávez va a iniciar un proceso de cooperación, cooperación sin condiciones con el pueblo haitiano. El 2008 comienza ese proceso que luego con el terremoto del 2010 en Haití, Chávez va a profundizar más esa relación. 248 proyectos impulsa el gobierno bolivariano en solidaridad con Haití. El total fueron casi 2 mil millones de dólares que sumando lo que dio la OEA, que sumando lo que dio la ONU, que sumando lo que dieron esas falsas ONG como la de los Clinton, no llegaban ni al 1% de lo que había dado el presidente Chávez y lo que dio el gobierno bolivariano para la solidaridad con Haití. Lamentablemente, de 2018 hasta el 2016-17, con los distintos presidentes que pasaron por allí, por Haití, hasta llegar al último, Moisés, esa plata se la robaron, esa plata la malversaron, y por eso es que allí, en un momento determinado, la gente comenzó a preguntar, ¿dónde está la plata de Petrocaribe? ¿Por qué no ha aparecido la plata de, de Petrocaribe? Que fueron casi dos mil millones de dólares. Es cuando allí se va a dar para mí la primera manifestación contra la corrupción más grande que para mí se ha dado en América Latina. Exigiendo transparencia en los fondos. Eso, por supuesto, acompañado de un pueblo en la calle. Ya también sabemos que anteriormente casi inmediatamente del terremoto, habían estado o se impusieron las tropas de la Minustá. Que la Minustá lo que dejó fueron violaciones masivas de niñas y de mujeres. Más de 40 mil niños huérfanos dejó la Minustá. Y además eso trajo el cólera. ¿Qué es lo que hoy se está planteando? Y de Venezuela también estamos apoyando... Haití, los movimientos sociales, sectores también eh, gubernamentales. Estamos planteando de verdad, como ya lo había impulsado eh, el profesor Chamel, ¿no? que fue un juicio público a la minustad. Y se está planteando las reparaciones. Y recuerden, este año se está cumpliendo 20 años del plan de acción de Durban. Y quienes estuvimos en Durban hace 20 años, una de las cosas esenciales que exigíamos eran las reparaciones. ¿no? Ayamu debe saber, porque creo que Ayamu estuvo allí en ese momento también, y dentro de eso las reparaciones para el pueblo haitiano. Porque Francia seguía y quería seguir exprimiendo una deuda que ya el pueblo haitiano le había pagado a Francia. Y aún tienen el descaro de seguirla pidiendo con el gobierno de Macron. Hoy se está planteando que ese, ese plan de acción debe desembocar en dos elementos esenciales. Una de esas reparaciones, ¿no? Segundo, la reforma constitucional. Si Haití, y todos lo recordamos, a diferencia de la constitución francesa, a diferencia de la constitución de Estados Unidos del siglo XVIII, la constitución más avanzada para los africanos y sus descendientes fue la constitución que firmó de Salim en el año 1804, que acabó con la esclavitud, cosa que no hizo ni Estados Unidos ni Francia, 
y también, por otro lado, ¿verdad? acabó con la trata negrera y repartieron las tierras. No al estilo de Jim Crow en, 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 en Estados Unidos. Fue una revolución esencial. Entonces, la reforma constitucional que en estos momentos está exigiendo el pueblo haitiano tiene que ser una reforma que implique las reparaciones, las reparaciones en el campo espiritual, porque condenaron a Haití a hacer una, una, una espiritualidad de maleficio y eso no es una filosofía de vida. Es eso. Nosotros consideramos desde Venezuela como movimiento social que es fundamental y esencial seguir impulsando hasta unas nuevas elecciones o las elecciones deben darse ya. Pero por otro lado también ¿verdad? las reparaciones, ¿no? Francia no tiene moral con qué seguir, cómo seguir exigiendo que le paguen una deuda. Estados Unidos tiene una deuda muy grande con Haití porque invadió Haití casi por 15 años. ¿Entiendes? Entonces son los elementos. Por eso digo que nuestra deuda con Haití es una deuda ética, es una deuda moral, espiritual. Y Haití no puede seguir estando sola. Porque siempre ocurre un fenómeno a nivel mundial y Haití se olvida. El gobierno venezolano está comprometido en este caso en llevarlo al Consejo de Derechos Humanos de la ONU. Y es un compromiso que nosotros tenemos. Muchas gracias por esta invitación. Thank you so much, Chicho, and thank you so much to all the panelists for these absolutely wonderful and excellent and heartbreaking um, presentations. Um, we have um, a, 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 a number of questions so far, and please, everyone, if you would like to ask questions, please click on the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's between the, it should be between the, the raised hand and the interpreter globe uh, on, your, uh, on your screen. And um, so we, we have a number of questions. So I'm going to try and, and start uh, with uh, the, first, uh, the first two. The first one is from, um, for the first two questions are for uh, Dr. Horn. And so I'm going to ask both of them. Um, one and then follow up and then we'll go with the other questions for some of the panelists and for all the panelists. So uh, Dr. Horn, um, what are some websites <laughs> that you would suggest for learning about the US backed attempt to seize the Amazon for slavery if this is available online? And I'll, I'll ask both of them together, I'm sorry, yeah. The second one is great presentation. You, you indicated several times Haiti's contribution to the struggle of the working class. In addition, as you indicate, the Haitian Revolution stands alongside the Cuban Revolution, Revolution as a classic example of the people's revolution. All this is indisputable. My question is that being the case, why did Marx devote so little attention to the Haitian Revolution? It seems he didn't have a lot to say about it. If that is true, do you have an opinion on why that is? Thank you. Point number one, with regard to the effort by the US to seize the Amazon River Valley, that is documented in the book, The Deepest South, the United States, Brazil, and the African Slave Trade, which was published by New York University Press and was translated into Portuguese. And actually it sold more copies in Brazil than it did in the United States in English for whatever reason. And if you follow the footnotes in that particular book, you'll find the primary sources that document that story. With regard to online, you know, <laughs> that book is probably online, although it's not supposed to be. <laughs> and um, secondly, um, one of the characters who was pushing this idea was the Virginian Matthew Fontaine Maury, M-A-U-R-Y. And he wrote voluminously on Brazil 
And so those works do not have copyright. And so, of course, they are online. Um, so just follow the sites with regard to Matthew Maury, M-A-U-R-Y. Secondly, uh, with regard to Marx on Haiti, uh, point number one is that the collected works of Marx and Engels were being published in East Berlin before the collapse of the German Democratic Republic circa 1991. Uh, my understanding was is that the, pro the project was still in motion at the time of the collapse. I'm not sure what's happened to the project since then. Point number two is with regard to that point. So you may want to check the indexes of the dozens of volumes before you pronounce upon any lack of assessment of the Haitian revolution. Point number three is that I just wrote a short essay, which you can find legitimately online, called Against Left-Wing White Nationalism, which is a critique of certain leftist racialized views that may have contributed to an inattention to Haiti. I mean, for example, the man who US patriots oftentimes point to as being the symbol of their so-called revolution, speaking of Tom Paine, uh, hardly had anything to say about the Haitian revolution, although he was supposedly a revolutionary. And what he did have to say was not that complimentary. Uh, so you may want to look at that essay. And also you may want to look at the, uh, one of the books I cite in my essay against left-wing white nationalism. It's the recently published book by the black scholar, Tyler Stovall called White Freedom. Um, so that is my response. Thank you so much, um, um, Professor Horn. I'm going to, um, um, the next question I think is to Ana Barreto, which, um, which um, asks, how did Lula respond to the killings in 2006? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. So. Sueli Carneiro, uh, one of the most important uh, Brazilian thinkers, she has a very famous phrase that says, between the right and the left, I am black. And uh, in, the, in the Brazilian history, the left is not necessarily much better than the right. Uh, during during the, the years of 2000s, there was increased militarization uh, in Brazil. In the Lula times, we have the Olympics, main, main source of violence and, um, and um, a proper legalization of taking the lands of black communities and indigenous communities. So this is a much more complex um, picture than to just think about um, left and right, uh, uh, like basically. So I, I always uh, I always quote Sueli when people ask about the left in Brazil, because one of the things that we say is that it's that it's not much different for people in the favelas and that for the people in the favelas and they don't see democracy. We, we don't see the difference because the, the the bullets are still arriving, the bullets are still killing us more. Thank, thank you so much, Anna. Um, that's a great answer. Um, I have two questions for Charo. Um, and one is quick question, Charo. Do you have any thoughts on the recent announcement of the assassination of a FARC leader in Venezuela? And if this will have an impact on the relations between two countries? Also, are you optimistic that the struggle of the new African communities in the US will ever be able to successfully to be successful in gaining rights over their land in the South that is different from that 
of the rest of the neoliberal white supremacist US. I'm not sure. Um, um, okay, yeah, so if you can try answer those, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, regarding the killing of uh, Sandridge, um, uh, apparently FARC confirmed that this actually happened. Um, we see this like as a smoke um, curtain uh, right at the moment of all this brutality happening uh, during the, the strike. Um, but if, um, I mean, any, any killing of members of FARC being them, uh, uh, the reorganized of the demobilized, it's, it's a sign that there is not uh, intention whatsoever from this government to really create a dialogue. We have been calling for humanitarian uh, dialogues um, and for quite some time since the, the signing of the peace accord, we have been looking to create conditions for including other uh, guerrilla groups like ELN on dialogues. Um, of course, this government has denied this possibility completely. So as long as these confrontations continue to happen, um, these are just escalating of um, lack of possibilities for any uh, conditions for dialogues and, and this searching for peace. So, you know, relations between the countries cannot be worse, <laughs> really. So um, it's more what happens against people and what is the impact on people that these kind of things uh, can create than uh, really the political relationships uh, or, or the, uh, between the governments. Uh, because as I say, can we worse in what, in, in what is really the impact is on people. Regarding the other question, if I kind of understand the question, look, um, we as the Black Communities Process in Colombia, who have been uh, for 27 years now since we or create the organization, uh, struggling to sustain the collective right to territories, to land, um, we really hope uh, that this is something that cannot happen only in Colombia, but in other countries. Um, um, you know, conditions in the United States with capitalism uh, as, as enrooted as it is, uh, can be very uh, difficult, uh, are very difficult here in Colombia. But that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be looking for this kind of, um, of uh, possibilities. Uh, I know that, for instance, uh, many Black of, of, uh, African people from the North have been moving back to lands in the South, uh, 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 that uh, movements have been trying to recuperate the land and urban areas, sensing buildings and creating economic and food sovereignty conditions. I think those are um, little steps toward a possibility for Black people to recover uh, their territorial rights. This is for me, for us, and a struggle to um, create conditions to recover and reinstitute um, territorial rights uh, uh, wherever we are. And um, I think that we have been looking for it. Thank you so much, Charo. I do have a question for the, the entire panel, um, and it's, what do you all think about Lula's upcoming election and what it would mean for Haitians that are still walking from Brazil to the current border because of his alignment with the West? That's the question. Anyone? Anna? Professor Horn? I, I don't want to be the first. I, I, I prefer the others to go. Well, I'll jump in if nobody else <laughs> will. I, I think it depends. Um, the international situation will help to determine uh, whether or not A, 
Lula is elected and B, what his policy responses will be, not least to Haiti. And the international situation, which as of now uh, features a new Cold War that's erupting between the United States and its allies on the one hand, including it appears the European Union, perhaps even India, vis-a-vis -vis China. Although it's likely that India will not be enlisting in the new Cold War against Russia, which is the other target of this new Cold War. And so this international climate, then you'll have to refract that through Brazil in terms of Brazil's close trade relations with China, for example, which even Bolsonaro had to yield to, to a certain degree, despite his campaign rhetoric uh, to the contrary. And then of course, the internal situation uh, in Brazil is going to be a determinative factor. Uh, I will not be so presumptuous as to pronounce on the internal situation in Brazil. We have a Brazilian sitting before us, so I will defer to you on that point. So Anna, yes, um, uh, <laughs> that's that's a difficult question. That's why I wanted to be uh, the last one. So I think it's such a complex, um, such a complex context. Um, we are we are being killing by thousands every day, um, and and to be really honest to change for a president that at least would um, take responsibility with the COVID response, for example, would be an advanced for, for, for our people. Um, at the same time, um, we, know, we know the history of Lula and PT. I have questions about how left they really are. I, I believe that many people do as well. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the militarization between the uh, during the PT governments not only, uh, as as uh, Jemina has mentioned, not only sending troops to Haiti but also uh, having agreements with Israeli police training Brazilian police, for example. Um, so it's it's it is much more a, a complex uh, situation. However, we are such in in despair at this moment and nothing, we, we don't understand what, why Bolsonaro is still in power today, uh, doing, in my opinion, crimes against humanity right now at this moment. Um, that um, Lula might, might, be, might be an, an option um, if, if, um, um, that's that's what it looks like to to take Bolsonaro out. The poll shows that Lula will win in the first um, turn, which is which will be a first in Brazilian history uh, for presidential elections. So that's that's this point. At the same time, I think that Lula is a too controversial um, candidate, in my opinion. People love him and people hate him. Uh, and uh, that's 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 a lot of risk in my opinion. Um, I also think, to be really honest here, I also think that part of his part of his part of something that I, I think should be taken in consideration is the preparing new leaders. I, I don't think I think that he wanted to be him and him and him. Uh, rather than prepare uh, leaders for the past election, uh, um, for folks that look at the Brazilian elections, uh, PT almost almost won, uh, and for me, uh, it didn't win due to mistakes of the own party. I also want to be very critical here to PT and to that decide to run until 
two weeks after the election, knowing really well he would not be able to do that. Uh, and then expect the social movements to, to push a candidate that nobody knows who is it. Um, so there is a lot, a lot of, of things to say in the, in the Brazilian politics. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I think that's, that's, that's a, a, a for another panel, I, I assume. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Anna. I do have a question for the entire panel as another question is to really talk about what some are calling the spiritual and, and cultural blockage of Haiti and Black Afro-descended people in the different countries in Venezuela, in Colombia, Cuba, Honduras, Brazil, some of them. So if you all would address that, you know, um, the, the, the blockade, blockage of Haiti or the inability to deal with Haiti and Black descendant populations in these areas, in these countries. Chucho, you go first? Oh, sorry, Chucho. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to let Shucho start it, but I'm going to start and I will let Shucho continue it because uh, this is a very important question and, and Shucho brought the, the, the issue. And um, for us in Colombia, and our struggle is uh, spirituality is fundamental. So I have to say that um, as fundamental as it has been, there has been also this war against our spirituality. I think Chucho mentioned, and I would like that he expand on that, uh, how that was suppressed in, uh, in countries like Haiti. But how has been suppressed here? We have to see from the moment that African people was brought to Colombia, I'm going to talk just about Colombia, from the moment that Black people, uh, African people was brought to Colombia, uh, there was a religion imposing. There was cut off of language communication where people could not communicate through language. There was the breaking of um, the, the structures that were organized uh, by, by communities through a spiritual uh, um, philosophy and an organization. And all that was broken just by kidnapping African people and bringing it through uh, the transatlantic trade to Colombia. And here then, you know, religious played a, a, a key role on um, humanizing the, these inhuman people, uh, trying, well, there was more intent to get uh, souls uh, to search for the souls of the indigenous or for that from the blacks because uh, we really didn't have anything. We weren't human beings, so souls were impossible to have. So there, there were all these elements uh, from religion, from the uh, uh, all the racist impositions, you know, through z z z slavery and then uh, with the, with the so-called um, um, signing of the, uh, what is that? La abolición de la esclavitud, the abolition of the slavery. Um, with all these things came the, then education, came uh, the dispossession of people that had uh, organized in, in, in specific territories and comprised little towns and villages to rebuild culture and rebuild this spirituality. So those are, have been processes and then came the so-called internal armed conflict. I have to say that we could have spoke about the internal armed conflict for certain period of time until the paramilitaries came to our territories and start massacring people. And it, this created a, a tremendous, tremendous spiritual damage because not only the separation from uh, people from Africa to these lands, but the separation from people that have been disappeared, killed and disappeared here in this country, uh, creates this uh, spiritual break, uh, broken, this spiritual uh, disconnection. For us, uh, 
the connection with people who die is very important because people transcend to other levels where it's still connected and it's still part of our lives. So it's another form of living that is still connect and support our lives, our, our struggles, our just regular living. When these, these connections are created with the, the disappearance, this is, this is very important, it's, it's, it's a hard and complicated thing to explain, but disappearance that happens from Africa to today when people was kidnapped and you never know where that, where that people is ever again and the disconnection is created between life and death, that creates a significant, significant um, break of power of, of African people. Um, the connection between life and, and death is strongly important and it was very important in Haitian Revolution. And um, it is important in our struggles. But when that disconnection is created, this, 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 this uh, hole in between uh, creates disempower us spiritually and culturally. So um, I hope this helps a little bit with the response. Uh, uh, but it's a very deep conversation and perhaps we need to do a webinar on this issue particularly because one of the things that we are working now on is precisely to understand and, um, and use spirituality also as a, a instrument for the struggle. Uh, spirituality plays a very political role in our struggles and we have to recover that as a also a, a weapon right now and the struggles that has uh, had, has brought us to these levels of extreme uh, brutality and violence thank you so much Taro. okay uh, uh, Chucho, we're running out of time, so I'm going to um, maybe this question will is similar to this one. Um, um, is and, and we'll wrap up. This is our last question for uh, for today. Um, it's we're over by two minutes already, but just want to make sure we ask this one. There are a couple of people who ask. Um, well, one is what does what role does the Afro Descendant Congress play in connecting these struggles in the Americas and Africa? Um, some people also asking link to that, um, you know, what, what we can think about, what, what, how can we pressurize, they say, African leaders. But I do want to, I wanted, I did want to ask what you all thought about the Afro-Descendant Congress in the struggles of the Americas. And also, someone also linked to this is how do we cross practically deal with the language translation and interpretation resources? That is a very real issue for um, African communities in the Americas. And finally, a link question, and since it's the last multiple question, is how do we think, why do we think the, uh, the, the, the protests in Colombia, Haiti, um, and um, uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, Haiti, Brazil, do not ga gather as much support and, and, and attention as, for example, what's happening in Palestine and, and so on? I know it's a lot of questions, but if you can, Briefly, you know, um, uh, chime in, um, 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 it would be wonderful. We can start with you, Chucho, since uh, you haven't spoken. Okay, uh, yo voy a hablar muy breve, no, breve, muy breve. La, la espiritualidad es lo esencial en el cimarronaje. Eh, si tú no tienes espíritu, Si tú no tienes una sombra cuando tú te levantas o cuando va caminando, tú no tienes alma. Y el alma es esencial. Y voy a decir esto. El vudú, por las investigaciones que he realizado en África, en Mali, en Angola, en Benín, en Congo, el vudú resume para mí es la síntesis de todas las espiritualidades 
africanas. Llámense Yorubá, Congo, Bambara, Mande. Por eso es que el colcondato romano en el siglo XIX intentó criminalizar el vudú, lo criminalizó. Pero para nosotros, hombres e hijos, mujeres, niños y niñas de la diáspora, sí, sí. la espiritualidad, los que nos da vida para seguir luchando en esta lucha contra la criminalización del racismo en todas las Américas, es la fuerza espiritual. Sí, sí. Quiero concluir algo que no se ha dicho aquí. Desde los movimientos sociales de Venezuela condenamos enérgicamente el muro, el muro de división que quiere hacer el gobierno de República Dominicana con Haití. Es una cosa tan estúpida, pero tan estúpida, tan estúpida que eso no cabe en la cabeza de nadie. Quieren repetir el muro entre, entre Israel ¿no? y Palestina. Quieren, quieren hacer el muro entre Mali, ¿no? Marruecos y España. Quieren repetir la muralización de la humanidad. Eso es bien estúpido. Condenamos abiertamente ese muro que se pretende hacer entre República Dominicana y Haití. Y sabemos que el público, el pueblo de Haití y el pueblo de República Dominicana van a romper ese muro. Una, la estupidez más grande en la historia que se ha hecho en la historia de las dos islas. Esas dos islas tan hermosas que nos siguen dando luces. Pero los presidentes, los gobernantes, los empresarios estúpidos quieren crear esa barrera entre los pueblos y no lo van a impedir. Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, thank you Chicho. And Charo, you have a quick... Just briefly, uh, yes, sorry, just to close very briefly. Um, I think we have to pay very close attention. This goes for the, the different questions that, that you try to combine. Um, I think that we have to pay very close attention to this right-wing escalation of, of power in, in some of our countries and see how we are going to organize to support uh, the struggles of African people around, right? We are talking about Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Haiti, Honduras, where is black people, African people, Afro-descendant people, the center of these struggles as we are the center of these uh, repressions and violence. These walls that <clears throat> are mentioned in Chucho are created in different uh, areas internally in the countries, like here, for instance. And what we need to look after is how we really support these struggles. Haiti right now has to be at the top level of our attention because um, being the first <clears throat> Black African Republic free um, in the middle of this struggle for self-determination, uh, we had to recover this as the main source of our struggles. So build up and, and turn our eyes and our efforts to make visible and support Haiti and take Haiti from these uh, uh, hands of, of imperialism is very, very important. And I think that we have to really come together to work on it. Thank you so much, Professor Horn or Anand, any other quick words? Okay, yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you the panelists for wonderful, heartbreaking contributions. The audience for hanging in, um, even as we went over a few minutes. Um, the BAPS operation team, Shade, Tunde, Julie, Jose, and the rest of the operation team, the interpreters, um, uh, and the Haiti America team, the BAP Haiti America team, um, and our national convener, Ajamu Baraka. Some announcements, please. If you enjoyed this program or want to be involved, please sign up for the Black Alliance for Peace newsletter at blackallianceforpeace.com at the top of the webpage. 
Also, you can learn about the work um, we've been doing on Haiti at blackallianceforpeace.com slash Haiti. And if you want to see more programs like this, please become a monthly sustainer because the Black Alliance for Peace is a grassroots organization. We do not take money from governments or corporations. So please go to blackallianceforpeace.com slash donate and become a monthly sustainer to support this growing movement within the US against US imperialism. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this wonderful conversation. We hope to see you all soon. No compromise, no retreat. Take care all. <laughs>